Welcome uh, to this morning's briefing on guarding against a nuclear-armed Iran, proliferation risks, and diplomatic options. Uh, I'm Daryl Kimball. I'm executive director of the Washington, D.C.-based Arms Control Association. We're an independent, non-governmental organization uh, dedicated to providing information and policy ideas to address the world's most dangerous uh, weapons, including nuclear, chemical, biological uh, weapons. And we publish the monthly journal Arms Control today. So it's good to have you all here. Uh, let me just remind you all to turn off your mobile devices so that we're not interrupted before we get going. Um, as you all know from this issue, uh, for the past decade, uh, Iran's nuclear program has been a subject of intense international concern since the International Atomic Energy Agency about a decade ago confirmed that Iran had secretly built a uranium enrichment plant. And in the years since, Iran has improved its uh, nuclear capabilities um, in various ways. Uh, and over the years, uh, Iran and the United States and the other great powers, uh, France, the UK, Germany, Russia, China, have fumbled uh, fleeting opportunities to resolve the issue through a negotiated deal. Uh, in the meantime, Tehran has expanded uh, its enrichment program and other sensitive nuclear fuel cycle activities, including its heavy water reactor at Iraq. Uh, and even as international sanctions on Iran have tightened and, and had a huge impact on Iran's economy. Uh, now, Iran's leaders apparently have not made a strategic decision to build nuclear weapons, and they do not... Uh, have uh, yet the necessary ingredients for building a nuclear arsenal, nor have they taken other steps necessary to build a nuclear arsenal. So there is time for diplomacy to secure a meaningful win-win deal to guard against a nuclear-armed uh, Iran. And with the August 3rd inauguration of Hassan Rouhani as Iran's new president, uh, Hassan Rouhani, the former Iranian nuclear negotiator, uh, there's a new and crucial opportunity to achieve, finally, a breakthrough to achieve meaningful and practical limits on Iran's enrichment program, uh, its other sensitive nuclear fuel cycle projects, better IAEA access uh, to its program uh, to ensure there's not a, a secret program going on uh, in exchange for significant uh, phased relief of the, the international sanctions that have been put in place over the years. Now, leaders in Washington and Tehran all say they want a diplomatic solution. From our perspective, uh, uh, at the Arms Control Association, I'm sure my colleagues here uh, agree, it's time to translate those words into concrete action, beginning with the next round of uh, P5 plus 1, uh, talks with Iran, the P5 plus 1, of course, being the permanent five members of the Security Council plus Germany, which is expected to be scheduled uh, soon, perhaps within a month. There's also an important meeting uh, on September 27th between Iran and the International Atomic Energy Agency to uh, try to address the long-running questions about potential military dimensions of its nuclear program. And I would just note that just this morning, uh, in a step towards those talks, uh, uh, President uh, Rouhani posted on his uh, Twitter account that Foreign Minister Zarif will lead Iran's negotiating team, which is a shift from uh, the previous um, uh, presidential uh, approach on this, the previous Iranian approach. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll hear from our colleagues about what that shift uh, could mean for the Iranian tactics and approach. Now, this is a very complex issue, um, and, and to help the public and you all here uh, and policymakers uh, better understand the key issues and the history and the options, um, the Arms Control Association uh, is releasing uh, today an updated version of uh, a briefing book that we uh, published earlier this year uh, titled Solving the Iranian Nuclear Puzzle, and there are copies uh, outside on the flash drives uh, that we have uh, provided for you. It's also on our website this morning at uh, armscontrol.org. Uh, it goes through all of the key issues, the history, uh, and the options up to date uh, as of uh, this week. More importantly, we have three excellent speakers here today. 
uh, to provide their analysis on the status of Iran's nuclear capabilities uh, and the elements required for a deal that could provide both sides with a win-win outcome. So first we're going to hear from David Albright, uh, who's to my right here. Uh, he's the founder and president of the nonprofit Institute for uh, Science and International Security. David and his team at ISIS uh, for many years have been a leading independent source of information on the nuclear programs of Iran, uh, North Korea, Pakistan, India, other states of concern. And among other things, he's going to fill us in on the latest International Atomic Energy Agency quarterly report on Iran's program and its implications uh, for uh, diplomacy uh, and Iran's nuclear capabilities. Uh, and then next up will be Colin Call. He's an associate professor in the Security Studies Program at the Edmund Walsh School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University, where he teaches courses on international relations, international security, the Middle East, U.S. foreign policy. He's also a senior fellow at the Center for New American Security, and from 2009 to 2011, uh, he served as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Defense uh, for the Middle East. And then uh, batting cleanup will be George Perkovich, uh, my friend and colleague of many years. He is, of course, the Vice President for Studies and Director of the Nuclear Policy Program here at the Carnegie Endowment, which is co-organizing and, 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 of course, hosting uh, this session this morning. George, of course, for many years has written on uh, nonproliferation and nuclear policy issues, and he's going to provide us with his perspectives on the path ahead. So with that, um, I'm going to turn over the podium uh, to David. Uh, after David and, and Colin and George speak for about 12 minutes or so each, uh, we're going to turn it over to you, the audience, for questions. And I'm sure we're going to get into a, a robust and interesting uh, discussion. So thanks all for being here. Uh, David, the floor is yours. OK. Thank you, Daryl. Um, as Daryl said, I'll be concentrating on Iran's nuclear program, its status, and, and some of the implications for negotiations. And mostly I'm going to be talking from the – or about results from the IA's quarterly safeguards reports, which is a an unclassified public document that the IA produces every – or four times a year as – to fulfill its responsibilities to its member states and also the UN Security Council uh, about – what it's trying to do to verify Iran's commitments under the Nonproliferation Treaty, and also whether Iran's abiding by uh, UN Security Council resolutions that have called for a suspension of its centrifuge program and then the, the halt to construction of the Iraq heavy water reactor. Um, and obviously, the, the IA um, reports that Iran is not um, fulfilling its obligations under the Security Council resolutions, and it's a a mixed message on the uh, verification of its commitments under the NPT, namely its declared nuclear materials are accounted for, but its potential or its past uh, activities um, and possibly ongoing activities may be in violation of the Nonproliferation Treaty. Um, it hasn't said they are, but it's, it's certainly raised enough concerns that, it, that it's an issue that has to be addressed. Now, the, one of the nice things the IA has been doing in this quarterly report is trying to put in enough detail so that the member states and the interested public can actually plot or chart progress um, of Iran's nuclear program. And, and at ISIS, we've tried to identify several metrics um, that kind of bring that to life. Um, and then you can just evaluate, is, in a sense, is thing, are things getting worse? From our perspective, their program is advancing significantly. Or are they getting better? In the sense, the program is, is going slower. And I think the last report is, is, is actually kind of a mixed bag. Um, I mean, for us, one of the most striking things is that their, the number of their centrifuges continues to grow quite dramatically. Um, and particularly the IR-1, the first generation, has, has this, over the last two years, they've doubled the numbers of IR-1 centrifuges. And they've also been installing advanced centrifuges. They call them the IR-2Ms. And they now have 1,000 uh, installed and, and, uh, and under vacuum, which means they could enrich uranium at any time. Now, the good news is, is that, that all these recently installed centrifuges are not enriching uranium. Iran has decided, for some reason, which we don't know why, 
not to actually use this growing centrifuge capability and essentially enriches in the same number that it's enriched in for the last two or three years. And, and again, we don't know why, but it, to us that's a positive development. It could, in that sense, they could be making a lot more 20% enriched uranium, um, which is viewed as the most sensitive material right now, than, than they are now. And so um, another metric we use is we invented a concept called critical capability, and it's just a measure of it's really it was motivated by how well can a deterrence policy as articulated by Obama, namely to prevent Iran from seeking nuclear weapons, how well can that policy work? And and from our view it works best if what you're really trying to do is deter Iran from making enough weapon grade uranium for nuclear weapons. I mean once from our view, once they have whatever amount, twenty five kilograms of weapon grade uranium is the amount we use what happens after that is going to be extremely difficult to work with. I mean, it, we don't know where it'll go. Um, it may take them several months to make a nuclear weapon, but you have no mechanism to know where that's going to happen. Um, and, and, and the facilities that could make a weapon are small. The IA stated that Iran knows how to make a crude fission weapon um, and was working on more sophisticated nuclear weapons. Um, and so they have a head start. But the bottom line is, is that if, if you're trying to deter them from breaking out and making weapon-grade uranium, then you want to have adequate warning of that. And so the idea of critical capability is when you could reach a point where you're going to lose that ability to have adequate warning. And what, it would, what does adequate warning mean? Ability to go in, strike militarily, and stop Iran from actually finishing making enough weapon-grade uranium for nuclear weapons. We think that deterrence, in a sense, is in effect now. It would take them, I think, if they use all their centrifuges, all their 20% in the form of hexafluoride right now, it would still take them a month to break out. And, in this, and this is a kind of a minimal estimate in our calculations. It could take longer if they have problems with the enrichment plant, which happens a lot in Iran. Um, but a month is enough, from our view, enough time. Where critical capability comes in is if they can do it in a week. Or, or two weeks, that then you're in an era or in a regime where you, they may, by delaying inspector's access, doing some other things, that it would make it hard for the IA to actually detect it or for intelligence agencies to detect it. Um, and so we, we think that it, based on their progress, the mid-2014 is when they would reach a critical <coughs> capability. And that at that point, I think Obama's deterrence policy would face serious challenges if it's, if it's intended to deter Iran from actually crossing the line. Um, and we don't see anything in this report that changes this. Um, also, on another bad news, I mean, they're, they're, the IAEA's continue to have no progress on weaponization and other military um, nuclear issues. I mean, the thing that's got the limelight in the last two years has been the Parchin site, but that's almost a, it's only a small part of the issue. I mean, the IAEA for whatever reason, decided to focus on Parchin, but the weaponization and military nuclear issues are much broader than Parchin. And, and in a sense, the focus on Parchin of the last two years has kind of s s allowed the focus on these broader set of issues to be um, reduced. And I think in this report, the IE is asserting that it wants that back in play more. And it laid out some of its positions um, to bring back um, a more realistic view of how to deal with those issues. And I think it, it uh, I think with all the activity at Parchin, if, if you follow that, which essentially is a site that had had no activity for years, the IAS to visit, and suddenly all kinds of construction activity starts to take place. Things are taken out of the building. There's all kinds of, of water being used, which could either be washing down facilities or cutting or cooling um, equipment that's cutting up um, equipment. And so you've seen asphalting of the site recently, um, and there isn't a lot of asphalting of facilities at Parchin. I mean, it's, a, it's um, creating large parking lots at this site is not normal. Bottom line is it's, it's not clear the IE can do much, if they, even if they went there. Uh, it, very likely they'll get an ambiguous result. And, and I think they're stepping back in this report to say, look, it's a much bigger issue and we need to revisit that. And just to put this in context, so what you're talking about is with Parchin, the, the site of suspected uh, uh, high explosive tests that have... Uh, could be related to... Could nuclear. be related to nuclear weapons. And 
the IAEA efforts over the last two years to uh, clarify that question and other questions about potential military activities have not made progress. Um, and for the first time in this report, as you're saying, the IAEA lays out several steps that Iran could take to help clarify that. And as I said at the beginning, their next meeting is going to be September 27th, so there is an opportunity for uh, progress if uh, the Iranians want to help achieve that. Yeah. Um, and hopefully Rouhani will, will make the right decision. I mean, I think without solving this weaponization, it's hard to believe that you can settle this issue. I mean, you certainly can get short-term deals, but without solving the weaponization, you're not getting to the core concern is, is, did Iran have a nuclear weapons program, and has it stopped that program? And, and the international community has ways of dealing with that, and honesty about past activities um, doesn't, doesn't usually lead to punishment. It leads to increased confidence that they won't do it again. And that's been played out in South Africa, Libya, Brazil, um, and other countries. So um, it, it is, is an important condition to, to achieve, and, and, and hopefully Rouhani will, will come clean on that. Um, the, you know, part of the problem, though, is Rouhani is the one who set this up in 2003 or was involved in setting up coming clean on a whole set of activities, uh, and, but hiding the weaponization. And so... He's very skilled, but again, is he going to make a different decision now? Um, I'm sure I'm running out of time. How much time left? You're doing okay. Okay. Four minutes. Yeah, another good news was that they didn't increase their stock of, of um, near 20 percent um, low enriched uranium hexafluoride, which Israel has laid down as a red line um, that if they get about 240 to 250 kilograms of that, then Israel will supposedly do something. And, 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 the way you, Iran can avoid that, one is stop making it, which it's not doing, or the other is convert it into oxide form for use in reactor fuel, the Tehran research reactor. And, and Iran is following the latter. And so the amount um, is being produced has stayed about the same, but it's been sending more off to the Esfahan uranium conversion facility for conversion into oxide. And, and that... Um, is, is seen as a positive develop, development. Um, and it's also an, a sign that Iran um, does respond to pressure. I mean, I, I think that's one of the advantages in this situation is that Iran um, can be deterred. Its behavior can be changed um, through, through various uh, pressure tactics. And that we saw that in 2003 um, when they radically changed their, their approach and I think you see it in, in, in this um, limit on the 20% um, enriched uranium production, or at least the, the st limiting the stockpile of the hexafluoride form. Um, it doesn't mean that they stop their program at all. Um, another positive step, although I, I think this, this shouldn't be overplayed, I mean, they... Iran is very proud, and it often will say things about its nuclear progress that are not realistic. And so it, um, a couple months ago, and in the last I report, um, or the one before in May, it, it, it said it would pretty rapidly start the Iraq heavy water reactor. Um, and, and in this report, it's clear they can't start it on that schedule, and they've delayed the, the, the startup date. Now, that reactor is important because Iran, Israel's bombed two reactors in the Middle East already, one in Iraq in 1981 and one in Syria in 2007. One would expect Israel to bomb this reactor too, and it could be um, kind of a way to get into the military option. And so there's certainly a – if you watch this, there's this uh, – you want to see this reactor uh, operation delayed. Um, that you just don't need the, the hassle. Iraq doesn't need the reactor, um, and um, and it's just, in our, from a, my point of view, just a disruptive element where it creates a, 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 another timeline um, that could lead to military action and, it, and, and, um, and, and also pose a dilemma for Israel. Are they going to not bomb it and allow it to operate? 
and I think that it would create dynamics in Israel that could increase the, the chance of a strike. And a heavy water reactor is especially worrisome from a proliferation perspective because heavy water reactors are better suited for plutonium production. Um, but w w that, that really could not happen for some time uh, until the reactor operates, correct? Yeah. Yeah, no, I think it, it, it also, I think the, thank you, Daryl. I think it, they've chosen to use a kind of core that isn't ideal to make weapon-grade plutonium. And um, they could have chosen a different core, and maybe they will in the future, but their core design, which was a, a fuel design provided by Russian entities back in the 90s uh, when Russia was working more intensively with Iran's nuclear program. I mean, it's not, it's not ideal. And Iran has no reprocessing capability that we know of right now, uh, and you need that to separate the plutonium from the fuel. So I think... Um, I think at ISIS, we don't we view the Iraq reactor as serious, but we don't see it as nearly as serious as the centrifuge program, and particularly the growth in the number of centrifuges. Um, and that, in that sense, without you would almost in an agreement you want to cap the enrichment output of the program. In a, we use the term separative work. You want to cap it at a much lower level than it is now, um, if you count all the centrifuges, and you'd actually want to roll back. Um, not a suspension necessarily, but a but a rollback in their in their um, number of centrifuges, because uh, you don't want this in, you don't want um, a capability there that could if the, if the agreement isn't working could lead to a, a huge surge in the production of twenty percent um, and be used in a breakout. And so we think that it's important to reduce the number of centrifuges. Um, some of the things not in the report, I mean, uh, two years ago, Abbasi Devani announced that they had suspended construction of a third centrifuge plant, um, and, and they would keep that suspension in place until the summer, or until two years, and, and that two years has passed, and so the questions remain whether Iran is building a third centrifuge plant, and given the number of centrifuges it's been installing at Datans, you have to worry that they, they could do it if they wanted. And it and it and um, and the IE doesn't have the mechanisms to um, to know, and Iran has refused to allow. Uh, or well, are you going to cover early notification, George? I I was going to say it would have to be in any deal, but I wasn't going to go back into right. the history of it. All right. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll leave it to George. But it's the but it, that's an issue that is that it remains. And then the last one is, um, how is Iran banking all these centrifuges? I mean, there's a lot of efforts to prevent them from buying things. There's a lot of successes in detecting their uh, illicit procurements of vital goods for a centrifuge. They need to buy a lot. You see a lot of efforts to buy. There's interdictions, but they have been getting what they need. And, and I think at ISIS, we used to think it, they were capped in a way. We now see that they probably have enough carbon fiber, which is a vital component of advanced centrifuges, for thousands of IR2Ms. And they, and they seem to have gotten some key goods for the IR1s that have allowed them to build a lot more than we would have thought they could build. And so, again, these centrifuges aren't operational, so we don't know if they have all the equipment they need in, in the plant to make them operational. But they, they appear to be getting getting up through the or bypassing the sanctions. And, and in our work, we see two big loopholes now. Uh, and I'll end with this: we see China not doing enough, and that Iran can buy buy there, and it can buy American there, it can buy German, it can buy French, um, and it and and it um, and it, which means it can get high tech goods for a centrifuge program. And Iran still wants those goods. Um, we also see the EU is a problem. Um, while they have good controls, we've seen cases where, I'll give an example, where goods went from Japan to the U.S., um, it was carbon fiber, went to, to Europe, to a good country, legitimate um, sale, and then it sort of disappeared in the EU, which is a big place, and many of the countries don't have the same level of controls as, as kind of the white knights there. And then it is trucked via Turkey or adjacent country to Iran. And so we've identified these two loopholes that need to be fixed. Coming in there, and thank you.
All right. Well, thank you very much, <coughs> David Albright, for that uh, great uh, summary of uh, where the program is, uh, what some of the implications are. Uh, now we're going to turn to Colin Call uh, to uh, give us his take on uh, where the negotiators might be able to go uh, with the election of Rouhani uh, after and after the last round of P5 plus 1 talks with Iran, which uh, were last held back in April. So, Colin, the floor is yours. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Daryl, and thanks to Carnegie for hosting, and thanks to all of you for coming out on a, on a morning uh, uh, to, uh, to listen to us. Uh, as Daryl mentioned, my remarks will basically focus on three things. Uh, whether there's a window of, of opportunity um, with the election of, of Hassan Rouhani as the new president of Iran to make some diplomatic progress. Uh, second, what a deal might look like and, and, and how U.S. negotiators should approach uh, getting that deal. And then finally, I'll just say a few words at the end about what the implications of a possible military strike on Syria might be for all of this, because it's obviously very much in the forefront of our, of our, uh, of our minds at the moment. Um, look, I think there's a lot of skepticism in some quarters in Congress uh, among the Israelis as it relates to Hassan Rouhani, but I, I think, uh, you know, he's a genuine moderate. He's not a reformer. Uh, he's not a liberal. He's not likely to transform Iran into a Jeffersonian uh, democracy. He's a regime insider and has been for the entire period of the revolution. Uh, but he's also a pragmatist uh, with a demonstrated history of being able to forge elite consensus on controversial foreign policy issues to include uh, the nuclear issue. Um, it's also important to keep in mind that Rouhani campaigned. Uh, I mean, the, the, the Iranian elections weren't fair in the sense that not everybody who wanted to run got to run. Uh, but uh, a lot of people voted in them, and Rouhani campaigned on a platform of reducing Iran's isolation in the international community. And his uh, opponents, uh, most especially uh, Saeed Jalili, who was uh, uh, Iran's national security advisor and the lead negotiator in, uh, in the nuclear issue, um, Jalili campaigned on a, on a strategy of nuclear resistance, of just saying no uh, to any compromise on the nuclear program. So to some degree, the Iranian... Uh, election was a referendum on whether the regime's current approach on the nuclear issue and on the sanctions issue was the right approach. And overwhelmingly, the Iranian public said no. Uh, so there is a mandate uh, for, uh, for, for change. Um, since his election, moreover, Rouhani has continued to emphasize his willingness uh, to engage substantively, seriously, and uh, promptly to find a nuclear compromise. He's also expressed a willingness to meet bilaterally at very high levels uh, with the United States, which is promising. He's put together a largely technocratic uh, cabinet, uh, and uh, including the English-speaking uh, Mohammad Javad Zarif, who was Iran's former UN ambassador during the Hatami uh, reformist era in, in Iran. He's a well-known figure in the, in the West. Uh, George has interacted with him personally. He can say more about uh, Zarif. And, but Zarif's going to be the foreign minister, and it looks like he'll uh, have the lead for the nuclear uh, negotiations with, with the P5 plus 1, although, as Daryl mentioned, this is breaking news via Rouhani's Twitter feed, so we'll have to see. Um, Rouhani's team has also suggested that the economy is worse than they imagined, and that uh, now this is a standard thing for, for new administrations to do in all countries to kind of lower expectations, but I suspect that they were actually shocked by how bad uh, the economy in Iran is as a result of sanctions, suggesting that they're highly motivated to cut some deal that reduces uh, the pressure. Um, I think it's also important to note that in Rouhani's writings and in some of the speeches and remarks by his team, to include Zarif, they make an interesting argument about Iran and nuclear weapons. It's common for Iranian officials to say that uh, nuclear weapons are prohibited by Islam. And so as a result uh, of the Supreme Leader's fatwa against nuclear weapons, Iran will never pursue them. What's interesting about an argument that Rouhani and Zarif and others have made is that not only are there religious prohibitions against nuclear weapons, but that actually the pursuit of nuclear weapons would be a net negative to Iran's security. That is, it wouldn't uh, provide strategic dividends for Iran, which strikes me as an argument that they may use uh, for stopping somewhere short of a nuclear capability, at least in their internal infighting with hardliners who may see uh, nuclear weapons potentially as very much in Iran's uh, security interests. There are a bunch of uncertainties, however, about how much uh, Rouhani can do. I think there's a window for, uh, of opportunity because of his election, but we don't know how much latitude the Supreme Leader will give him ultimately on the nuclear issue. The Supreme Leader is uh, the ultimate decider on, on this issue. Uh, we don't know how the negotiations will be framed. 
If it's true that Zarif will take the lead, does that mean that the P5 plus 1 talks need to be elevated to the ministerial level? After all, he's the foreign minister. Or who will he appoint at kind of the undersecretary political director level, which the current talks uh, uh, have, been, have been ongoing? Will Zarif take the lead in a bilateral dialogue? Will a bilateral dialogue even happen? Will it happen in the context of the P5 plus 1, or will it happen quietly, privately, on the margins of something else? Uh, we don't know uh, uh, any of these uh, things. It's also not exactly clear what type of arrangements Rouhani uh, might be willing to accept and, more importantly, be able to sell to the Supreme Leader and other factions uh, competing for the Supreme Leader's ear uh, in Iran. Rouhani has repeatedly said that he's willing to have Iran have full transparency, which I interpret as some combination of increased inspections on Iran's program and coming to terms with the IAEA on their past military dimensions. That's all good. But I will say that transparency in and of itself won't be sufficient for uh, the P5 plus 1, in particular the West, because there have to be fundamental limits on Iran's nuclear program in terms of levels of enrichment, numbers of centrifuges, numbers of facilities, those types of things. So transparency alone, which appears to be Rouhani's watchword, is is, is, is necessary but not sufficient for a deal. So can he sell something else? Um, What's also clear, though, from Rouhani's statement is he will not be able to accept or sell a deal that doesn't in some way allow him to to frame it as respecting Iran's rights under the NPT uh, to nuclear energy, which they interpret as meaning uh, some level of domestic enrichment. I think the probability of this Iranian government or the Iranian regime in general agreeing to uh, an overall compromise with the P5 plus 1 that calls for a permanent suspension of enrichment, the probability of that happening is zero. Uh, this uh, regime will risk a war, including with the United States, uh, to defend its, what it interprets as its rights, which means that it's probably not the right thing for the, uh, for the P5 plus 1 to insist upon, and we can talk about that later. Uh, you know, Daryl mentioned there's, there's been uh, uh, no date set for the next round of P5 plus 1 talks. I think that there was hope that some might happen before the UN General Assembly meeting. I don't think that looks likely anymore, and I think if a serious strike happens in the next two weeks, it's even less likely that something happens in September, uh, so things could slip uh, further. I'll, g- I'll get back to the Syria issue in a minute. If talks resume, uh, there's already an offer at the ta- on the table from the P5 plus 1 issued at the, at the uh, two Almaty uh, rounds of negotiations. Um, The current P5 plus 1 offer is a confidence-building measure that attempts to get an initial agreement that can be built upon towards a final agreement. It calls on Iran for a period of six months to suspend all of its 20 percent enrichment activities, to ship out its stockpile of 20 percent material that is not immediately required for medical purposes, to agree to enhance IAEA monitoring of some of its centrifuge production and assembly facilities, and to suspend activities at its Fordo enrichment plant, the deeply buried enrichment facility that's under a mountain near the holy city of Qom, and that's a major concern to both the U.S. and Israel, to suspend activities there and to reduce the readiness of that facility. Previously, they had called for shuttering Fordo, but they've moved off of that. In exchange, the P5 plus 1 would uh, provide relief from U.S. and EU sanctions on gold and petrochemicals, uh, provide licensing for U.S. repairs for Iranian civilian aircraft, and pledged to have no new UN or EU proliferation-related sanctions for the period of the confidence-building measure. If Iran agrees, the six-month period would then be used to negotiate the next step towards a final agreement. So that's the general framework on on the table. I call this framework small for small. A lot of people call it small for small. It requires relatively small concessions from the Iranians and provides relatively little in exchange for those concessions. My personal belief is that small for small can't work. It can't work because even though I think it's a fair deal from the U.S. perspective, it it looks like a raw deal from the Iranian perspective. Um, Their two biggest sources of negotiating leverage over the West are their 20 percent enrichment and Fordo. And this deal asks them to give up those two most important sources of leverage for what they view as peanuts. So I just don't see them being able to – I think it's a fair deal, objectively. But I don't think it's one that the Iranian leadership can accept or sell. I also fear that if the P5 plus 1 goes back – with a new negotiating team and Rouhani being elected, and they go back with the same old offer, it will give ammunition to Rouhani's critics that his election and his softer tone has bought them nothing. It's got them nothing in the negotiation framework. So I don't advocate small for Saul. Some have advocated, okay, well, we need to do more for small. That is, we ask the same things for the Iranians, but we promise to give them more on the sanctions front. This is a terrible idea. Uh, It's a terrible idea because it's a horrible negotiating tactic. It basically sends a signal to the Iranians that the longer they wait, the better deal they get, which is exactly the wrong signal to send them. Uh, Plus, 
it, the only thing that the, the Iranians really want is significant relief from financial sanctions or oil sanctions, and those are the biggest sources of Western leverage over Iran. So we shouldn't give up those sources of leverage for a small deal. So more for small, bad idea. So some have said more for more. Let's, off, let's ask more for the Iranians in general and offer them more in terms of sanctions relief. What could that mean? It would mean that the P5 plus 1 could offer Iran significant sanctions relief on the financial front, on the oil front, or on the insurance front in exchange for everything in the current confidence-building measure, plus Iran doing something with its 3.5% low-enriched uranium stockpile, oxidizing it, shipping it out of the country, uh, putting it in escrow, uh, something like that, as well as agreeing to much tougher inspections, perhaps even the additional protocol, which they implemented for a few years when uh, Rouhani was the, was the nuclear negotiator in 2003, 2004. Um, however, while I think this is better than the small deal, it would also require the West to give up its biggest sources of leverage, central bank and Iran sanctions, oil sanctions, insurance, for a deal that's less than complete. I would rather use those sources of leverage for the big final deal, not some interim deal of any, of any size. Although, like I said, this would be clearly preferable to the small agreement. So what I would propose is what some people call big for big. Uh, that is that uh, the P5 plus 1 explicitly flesh out a roadmap for the end game up front instead of laying, uh, allowing it to be implicit, which is basically what the way that I understand it to be now. Now, this could start in private. It could start in a bilateral setting between exchanges between the United States and, and Iran. We'll have to see. But you'd flesh out a roadmap for the end game, what Iran's nuclear program would look like and what types of sanctions relief uh, they would get in exchange. Uh, and then you'd have phased implementation. So instead of having confidence-building measures that build towards a final agreement, you would have a roadmap for the final agreement that is implemented in a series of confidence-building measures. All right? So it's, it reverses the order of the current uh, negotiations. What would such an agreement look like? I don't know, uh, but I think there's, there's broad analytical consensus that it would have several components. It would permanently cap Iranian enrichment at 5%. Uh, it, it would still allow some level of enrichment, which would be hard for a lot of people in the United States and in Congress uh, to stomach, uh, but it would cap it at 5%. It would limit Iran's domestic stockpile in perpetuity to less than one bomb's worth of low enriched uranium of any kind. It would limit the quantity and type of centrifuges as well as the number of facilities. It would stop, dismantle, or otherwise suspend activities at Arak, the plutonium uh, reactor that David mentioned. It would resolve disputes over past military dimensions of Iran's nuclear uh, research uh, with the IAEA. And Iran would have to submit to much more intrusive inspections, at the very least the additional protocol and problems, probably some additional things. In exchange, the P5 plus 1 would clarify that Iran would be allowed some limited, safeguarded domestic enrichment, which would at least, at least implicitly recognize some right to enrichment. At least it would allow the Iranians to sell it that way. They'd get significant sanctions relief, everything that was proliferation uh, related. Uh, it would provide, the P5 plus 1 would provide peaceful nuclear cooperation. For example, perhaps an alternative for the reactor at Arak, uh, fuel assemblies for the Tehran research reactor, medical isotopes, those types of things. It, the P5 plus 1 would have to assure Iran against forceful regime change, or at least the United States would have to, would, uh, have to make that pledge, I would imagine, probably in private. And uh, perhaps uh, the United States would have to offer the prospect of some long-term dialogue with the Iranians on security matters uh, in the region, something that the Iranians have periodically signaled they want. I think moving quickly in this direction is preferable for a couple of reasons. One is time, and this relates to David's point. You know, if you take kind of worst-case assumptions about Iran's current technological trend lines, by the, but in the next 12 to 18 months, they could start to hit milestones, which could make either the deterrent strategy, which David referenced, or the possibility of an Israeli military action much more likely, whether that be a breakout capacity in the form of uranium enrichment or because the Arak reactor could, uh, could uh, become live, and in that moment before, that could create a very tense time, especially for the Israelis, about whether they bomb that reactor. So we don't have a heck of a lot of time under worst-case assumptions, and so I think we should benchmark our diplomatic schedule uh, to that. Um, I also think that a bigger deal is much more likely to be able to be implemented by the United States, because I don't see Congress substantially waiving sanctions for a small deal. In fact, the probability of that happening is zero. I see it more likely they would increase sanctions uh, uh, in, in, if they could in the face of a small deal. Uh, they, would, they would somehow frame it as intransigence by the Iranians and, and use it as a reason to increase sanctions. Uh, I don't see any prospect of, of Congress dialing back on sanctions unless there's a big, big deal. 
uh, that can be sold uh, uh, as a substantial limitation on Iran's nuclear program. I also think the offer of a bigger deal gives Rouhani something he can use domestically against hardline opponents to make the, make the claim that he's changed the contours of the conversation and has shifted it and is having Iran's rights respected. I think that's, that's something that's important for him. And last but not least, ostensibly the deal that I outlined gives Iran every single thing that they've asked for. In a way, it calls their bluff. If, they, if in reality they have no intentions to build nuclear weapons, they should be satisfied with this deal. But if they have secret intentions to build nuclear weapons and they reject this deal on those grounds, it would be very clarifying for the international community. And if the United States needs to take military action and galvanize as much international support for such action as possible, it would be much better in a context in which a good, generous offer was slid across the table on the Iranians still said no. Right? Speaking of military action, let me just say one or two things about, about Syria because I know it's on a lot of people's minds. The reality is that there is no one Iranian elite view on Syria. They're deeply divided. Rouhani and his uh, moderate allies have, have, have basically made the case that all use of chemical weapons uh, are, is abhorrent. They have not generally assigned blame to anybody, either Assad or the opposition, and have called for this issue to be resolved through the UN. All right? So they've taken a fairly sedate tone. Uh, they have, un, in contrast, however, hardliners within the regime, especially among the IRGC, have basically said the opposition did this, and if the Americans strike, uh, Syria will light Israel on fire. All right? This is a standard argument. I wouldn't believe that bluster. Israel has struck Syria five times since 2007, and the, and the Iranians have done bupkis. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, uh, it, is, it is a threat. So I think the Syria issue generates friction between the moderate fra uh, faction and the hardline faction that I believe has an interest in trying to spoil both Rouhani's success domestically and his ability to improve relations with the West. So this will be a huge test for Rouhani when and if military strikes happen. I think in the aggregate, the strikes could arguably help convince Iran that the United States is serious about its threat to use all options on the table to prevent them from having nuclear weapons, which could add to this deterrent effect and maybe even give Rouhani an argument to push back against the notion that some hardliners advance that the United States is a paper tiger that isn't serious about uh, uh, using military action. I think it would arm him to make that argument. But in the near term, it would put him on the defensive, I think. Uh, by potentially allowing his, his adversaries to paint him as soft and weak in the face of Western aggression. So the answer is we don't know what the effect of a strike uh, would be, uh, but uh, it certainly will create a wild card in, in the uh, diplomatic equation. Thanks. Thank you very much, Colin, for that uh, very robust and detailed uh, outline of, of some of the, the, the steps forward. So with that, George Perkovich, Director of Studies here at Carnegie, your, it's your turn. Thank, thanks, Daryl, um, and thank all of you for coming. I, I want to build on, on what um, Colin set out near the end in particular when he talked about the importance of going for a big for big uh, type deal um, because I, I agree with that premise entirely that, that the only way um, to get a diplomatic resolution of the Iranian nuclear issue is going to be um, to put out uh, how you actually end the, the crisis over this uh, issue, and that has to be um, uh, big in, in the ways that uh, Colin suggested. And trying to do it a little bit at a time, confidence building incrementally, um, doesn't work for the reasons that uh, Colin mentioned. And also, I would I'd just reinforce it by saying um, you, you'd have to, a president in either country would have to expend a lot of political capital to get the various uh, uh, opponents or skeptics uh, to agree to anything, including a, a little incremental process. And, and neither of them will have that much political capital to spend for a series um, of incremental steps. So I think you have to frame how the thing ends and then, then implement it um, in incrementally. Um, in, in building out uh, what Colin said, I, I would add a couple of points. Um, one is that we have to understand that the leader of Iran, uh, Ayatollah Khomeini, um, is, is like many uh, uh, religiously trained people, he's obsessed with fairness or with his understanding uh, of fairness and justice. And like many heads of state, he doesn't know details of nuclear policy. Um, this is not peculiar to Iran. Uh, it, 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 anybody who has talked with uh, uh, heads of states or foreign ministers and uh, starts to get into details of nuclear policy issues realizes they don't, they don't 
follow those uh, details. Um, but they get the general principle. And so Khamenei's principle is going to be basically, okay, is it fair? Are we being asked to give up a lot more than we're getting, number one? And number two, are they discriminating against us? Are they, are they, are they picking on us? And so in terms of thinking about how to, how to design a deal and how to, uh, how to approach it, I think, I think we have to have uh, those general principles in mind. And so the framework that I would uh, suggest is, as we think about it um, borrows from uh, President Reagan. Um, those of you who, who remember I mean, his famous thing about negotiating uh, arms control with the Soviet Union, which, by the way, uh, the people who elected him in 1980 did not expect, and the early Reagan uh, would not have been expected to have been a major uh, a, a leader a nuclear arms reduction, but in the second term he did that, and he said, um, uh, trust but verify. All right? That was how he explained what they're going to do. Well, with Iran, I think we should distrust and verify. So not trust but verify, but distrust and verify. And that will be mutual, by the way, because as much as we distrust Iran, they distrust us like a thousand times more. Uh, and we can talk about the historical reasons uh, for that. So under the, the notion of distrust and verify, well, uh, w w what do I mean? Well, they say they don't want nuclear weapons. They say there's a religious fatwa against it, and as Colin mentioned, they say it's not in their security interests. That's great, except um, the U.S. government and others don't believe it. So, th so a deal would have to pick up on what they say is their position, but, but verify that that's their position. We say we don't seek regime change and that we welcome them having a peaceful nuclear program. They don't believe that. And they're kind of right because parentheses, we do seek regime change, um, always have. Uh, the U.S. government doesn't support the Islamic Republic and the theocracy with the Veliati, the leader of the jurisprudence. On. So the issue is actually um, uh, that the U.S. would not physically or otherwise try to bring about regime change uh, in Iran. And by the way, the Iranians don't support the U.S. regime or liberal uh, democracy. We talk about our arrogance and corruption and uh, so on. But the issue is, you know, they're not going to try to develop nuclear weapons or otherwise physically uh, uh, endanger us and our allies. And then we wouldn't be physically uh, endangering them. But we have to demonstrate that. And then we have to demonstrate that we um, actually do uh, recognize uh, what they claim as a right uh, to peaceful uh, nuclear energy, which currently they don't believe. So as Colin suggested, I mean, I think the basic, with, with, with that kind of frame, the, the basic uh, approach is um, for them to convince us they don't seek nuclear weapons, yes, they're going to have to provide uh, transparency, as we've all uh, talked about. That means, you know, signing or implementing the additional protocol, which is a kind of a stronger mode of inspections that the International Atomic Energy has, uh, Agency has developed. It means going back to something David alluded to, um, there's a thing called subsidiary 3.1, which basically um, is, is a commitment that states uh, make to the International Atomic Energy Agency that they will tell the agency when they're planning to build a new nuclear facility, and then will provide them with design information before construction starts and so on, so that the agency could then monitor and have a better idea of what's supposed to be that, that there aren't hidden compartments underground and that you don't wait until the facility is basically constructed and then they say, oh, by the way, it's constructed and in two months we're going to start enriching uranium. So, so this, this agreement um, is an important way to provide transparency but also a lot of warning. Iran unilaterally several years ago um, basically abrogated their commitment there. And so they would have to put uh, this back. And then there would have to be, uh, as David suggested, additional transparency um, necessary to address the questions about whether Iran had done military experiments uh, in the past and to build confidence that they wouldn't in the future. And this is what David's talking about that the IAEA has been trying to focus on. I think there, there are a couple of important things to say. One, We've been asking for a long time Iran to, quote, come clean about 
its past nuclear activities. And U.S. intelligence and others believe that before 2003, at least, they, did, they were doing experiments related to making uh, nuclear weapons. And we say, well, we ought to come clean. But we've never said we would indemnify them for coming clean. So in other words, like every cop show, when the, you know, the, the, the cops there or the DAs say, ah, tell us what you know, and the guy says, or his lawyer better, you know, says, yeah, but first you've got to guarantee him uh, you know, you're not going to prosecute or he doesn't get the chair or whatever the, the, the thing is. We haven't done that with the Iranians. So we say come clean. All right, so if, we, if they give us the answers, then do we bomb them based on those answers? I've asked government officials for years about this. Have we offered and said, look, whatever you use, we won't use against you. Whatever you say, we won't use against you. And they say, no, a French official years ago said, well, they haven't asked for it. And I'm saying it's like, so the Iranians are supposed to say, okay, so if we tell you what we did, then what are you going to do? Um, it, it's, it's not realistic. So we have to put that out there as part of um, seeking this kind of transparency. And then very importantly on transparency, the leader will insist that what they do be consistent with the non-proliferation treaty, so they're not being asked to do more than they're legally required. That will be challenging, but I think you know experts in this room, David and others in the U.S. government, can come up with examples within the non-proliferation treaty that go beyond the routine. In other words, Iran is non-compliant with its obligations under the IAEA. Other states have been non-compliant too. Libya, South Korea, Egypt. And so one of the issues would be, well, what kind of transparency and remedial steps did those countries have to take in order to satisfy the world that they were now back into compliance uh, with their obligations? And so what Iran might be asked to do wouldn't be what you're uh, asking, um, uh, you know, pick a country that, that no one uh, suspects Maybe there isn't such a country, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, kind of routinely. But, but you're asking them to do uh, things for which there are precedents. South Africa is another example where South Africa disarmed. They had nuclear weapons. They had done a lot of enrichment, like Iran. Uh, and then they joined the NPT. And so to do that, they provided uh, extra information. So framing what would be asked of Iran based on precedent, I think, is very important. On going beyond the fuel cycle stuff that Colin and David talked about, I think has to be part of it. In other words, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty doesn't define a nuclear weapon, and it doesn't define nuclear weaponization. What the world wants from Iran is to know, to have confidence that they're not going to build nuclear weapons. So I think an agreement has to specify additional, beyond the enrichment issues, has to specify ways that we'll know uh, or limits that Iran would agree to in the area of research and development, experimentation, adapting missile nose cones, so that you have confidence, in fact, that they're not going to build uh, nuclear weapons. And the way to frame that, I think, is something that Rouhani offered in 2003 and 2004 when he was the chief negotiator. He came up with the phrase uh, in, in negotiation with France, uh, UK, and Germany. We will provide objective guarantees that Iran will not seek nuclear weapons. All right? That was the phrase. Now, at that time, in 2003 and 2004, the EU3 said, well, the only objective guarantee is you don't do enrichment or plutonium reprocessing. So it focused on the fuel cycle. And that was the whole issue then about suspension and so on. And then the Iranians suspended for a little while. They didn't get anything for it in their view, and so they broke out of it. But I think resuming the objective guarantees framework, but now we'll have to acknowledge that Iran is going to do enrichment, which is a huge win for them. And so you have to go to them and say, look, you won, Rouhani, because remember in 2003, this was the issue, and you were insisting that you wouldn't give up, you wouldn't suspend. We insisted you had to, but you won. But you also agreed there had to be objective guarantees. So now that you're doing enrichment, we're going to need layers of objective guarantees that somehow compensate for what you won, which was the, the biggest objective guarantee uh, that we wanted. And some of that has to be in the area of weaponization, where Iran would specify the kinds of things they would forego, which at a minimum would include all the kinds of experiments that the IAEA is worried about that they did in the past, and then also benchmarking and transparency about what, in fact, they did uh, uh, in the past. But I think the, the weaponization side 
needs to be looked at. Um, these guys talked about the Iraq reactor, the, Pluto, the heavy water reactor. A couple brief points on that. Um, it's very helpful if Americans and Israelis and others don't emphasize this a lot, especially publicly, like the great threat of the Iraq reactor and, you know, we've got to capture that reactor because it just drives the price up in Iran um, when you do that. Uh, and so I think, you know, keeping it as low-key as possible is important. Um, it's worth exploring in addition to them not building that reactor or suspending, which may be harder. Are there technical modifications that could be done to the reactor? Are there ways that it could be operated and verified at lower power or, or how long they keep the fuel in the reactor? Or could you switch the, the core or, you know, do other modifications so that if, if the reactor continued to exist, the concerns about its usability for breakout uh, could be uh, addressed. Uh, on, the, on the right to enrich, which Iran has insisted upon, as Colin said, they will have to be able to say they won, even if we don't put it in those terms. Um, I would modify that, and this is something my, my colleague Eli Levite has suggested, which is basically the right way to think about it is you know, the right to make fuel for peaceful purposes in reactors, all right? Enrichment's just a means to an end, so why fetishize it? Um, and, and, I mean, the issue is the right to make fuel. Now, Iran can talk about the right to enrich. One of the reasons why this is important is there could be value in then saying that Iran and other countries who would do enrichment should turn that product into fuel immediately, or peg the quantity of the product that they're enriching to the quantity of the fuel that they need and can make. And so by focusing on the fuel issue rather than uh, enrichment per se, um, if this is going to be a, a model, um, it has, it has uh, greater value. Um, last point, just building on what Colin had said, um, you know, clearly what's in it for Iran um, as I alluded earlier, they're worried about regime change. That's what they think the sanctions are about, all right? Especially the heavier sanctions as they've come. That's regime change. So that has to be a schedule and a plan for removing those sanctions absolutely has to be part of the arrangement. Now, you may implement it incrementally, just like they would implement what we want incrementally, but you have to give them the map and the schedule and the trade-off by which those sanctions would come off. And that's the most material way that we could demonstrate to the leader um, that, in fact, this isn't about regime change. It's about the nuclear program. And so if they take the steps we need on the nuclear program, those sanctions um, would, would come off. Um, last thing I would say, unless I already said that was the last thing, in which case I'm sorry, um, <laughs> that we naturally focus, especially in Washington, on, you know, are the Iranians ready to make a deal? Could they live up to a deal, you know, so on and so forth? I think it's at least as difficult to ask whether the United States would be prepared um, to, to make a deal and then uh, to implement it to the extent that implementing it would require bipartisan cooperation, which means to the extent that Congress would have to go along with providing some of uh, 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 the trade-offs uh, that the Iranians would insist uh, from the U.S. Because if, it, if relieving sanctions or some of the sanctions is going to require that cooperation, um, I think we have to look long and hard uh, at whether this town is prepared and these political parties are prepared uh, to deliver on our end of, of uh, any deal. And by the way, this is a question that the Iranians want to know. So we always want to know, okay, are they, what about their politics and will the leader go along with it and the Revolutionary Guard go along with it and should we, are we being dupes and everything else? They're sitting there going the same thing. They're saying, great, I can negotiate with Obama, but he can't deliver anything. He can't get a budget. He can't do this. There's a whole list. So what makes us think that even if we negotiate with this, this with you, you're not just going to pocket what we've offered on our side, and then you're not going to deliver uh, uh, on your side. And so I think that's a big challenge uh, for us. Thank you. Thank you, George. So you've just heard a lot uh, of very good ideas on, on, on uh, the Iran nuclear issue, and I'm going to just kind of underscore a couple of key points that I'm, I'm hearing, and then we're going to get to the questions in just a second. Um, as David said, Iran's nuclear program is advancing slowly in some areas, a little too quickly for our taste in other areas. Um, 
so there is time for diplomacy still, uh, but that time can't be squandered. And as we heard from uh, George and, and Colin, you know, both sides need to exhibit more creativity, uh, some much more realistic thinking about some of the key issues. Uh, we can't simply repeat old uh, proposals uh, from the past that didn't quite uh, get us across the finish line. Uh, there is a new team in Iran. Um, uh, they should be tested. Uh, their, their, their more positive words need to be uh, tested out. Uh, and the talks need to begin soon. And um, as Colin said, it's hard to tell how the Syria crisis is going to affect things, but um, it, it's certainly going to probably put a delay in, in the, the schedule for the, the, the next round of P5 plus one talks. And so the diplomatic option remains the best option, as difficult as it is. Uh, diplomacy is never easy. Um, and um, the other thing that I think we need to keep in mind, we didn't talk about this here, maybe we can get into the Q&A, is that um, people talk about the military option and there is the threat of military strikes, but I think, and maybe others in the panel have some thoughts on this, that uh, you know, military strikes in the context of Iran uh, are a, it's a false uh, option in the sense that it can't end the program unless we're willing to put boots on the ground in Iran. And as we can see from the Syria debate, uh, a lot of people have a lot of hesitation about uh, even cruise missile strikes against uh, uh, limited uh, sites. So diplomacy remains the best option on, on the table. Uh, this is a critical period uh, for all parties to finally make progress before uh, the situation on the ground with the centrifuges and more uh, becomes more challenging uh, sometime next year. So with that, let me open up the floor to your questions. Um, there are a couple of folks on the side who have microphones. I just ask you to raise your hand, identify yourself. Uh, we'll start here on uh, stage right. Um, and please let us know who you'd like to answer your question. Um, Jasmine Ramsey from Interpress Service. This question is for Mr. Albright. Um, I wondered if you could just uh, clarify for me, what are we supposed to be watching for the breakout capability in Iran? And is the assessment that they haven't been able to advance those, those elements of their program or that they're purposefully slowing it down or delaying it? Thank you. Yeah, well... <clears throat> the breakout capability is is something they could do at any time. I mean, they can just they could just decide we want to make weapon grade uranium at the facilities, and they could just do it. But they're not, and and that can be um, for many reasons. But I think one of the reasons is that they know that if they went to make weapon grade uranium, they would probably suffer an attack at least from Israel. So in that sense, they're they're deterred. Um, they may also not feel a need to do it now. They may not have any, you know, as Daryl mentioned, they haven't made a, as far as we can tell, they haven't made a strategic decision to build nuclear weapons, so they may see no, no need to do it. Um, now, in terms of what we're watching is when they reach a capability where they can do it without being detected in a timely manner. Because Obama said, President Obama said that he wants to prevent Iran from getting nuclear weapons. And he hasn't been very clear about what that means. But one of the things is that if Iran goes to do it, he must have some strategy to stop them. And what we're looking at is, well, if, you try to, if you're going to do that, have that as your policy, then it's a lot easier to stop them if what we're talking about is preventing them from getting weapon-grade uranium, in a sense, the long pole in the tent of making nuclear weapons. And so... You don't want to have to have a policy that says, look, they've gotten weapon-grade uranium and or and maybe enough for one or two bombs. We don't have any idea where it is. And, and then the U.S. is going to stop Iran from turning that weapon-grade uranium into a nuclear explosive device or maybe even a weapon. Maybe it'll take three months. Maybe it'll take two years. Who knows? But there's no mechanism that's clear that could deter Iran from doing that. I mean, again, get into this question Daryl's raised. Yeah, you could destroy the entire country, but if, if the policy is to prevent Iran from getting nuclear weapons, it's a lot easier to destroy four or five nuclear facilities that are involved in a breakout than trying to, in essence, bring Iran to its knees to, and, and surrender, in a sense, and give up this weapon-grade uranium that they have. So, so what we watch is when do they have a capability in place 
that would allow them to break out without being detected. And, and no, it would be Natanz, Ford Al, potentially a secret centrifuge site. And again, this is a, we're looking at it in a policy framework. This isn't an argument for war. We're actually, our, what we try to do is design things that would prevent military strikes, that, that, that we don't see that as, a, as, a, as in any way a desirable option. But the U.S. government has laid out a position that, that it's, it wants to prevent Iran from getting nuclear weapons, and that inevitably brings in military options. And what we're trying to think through is, well, what does that mean? When does the policy work optimally? When does it not work so optimally? And, and that's why we came up with this idea of looking at critical capability, because we think that if they reach a critical capability, can break out in secret, then that affects the ability to implement this this deterrence policy. If I can just pile on for one second, Jasmine, because this is a really, really important question I think is actually not very well understood or at least articulated in the wider discourse on this. For the most part, the administration has said that an Iranian nuclear weapon or a move towards a weapon is unacceptable. At times, in fact, the, the president described this as a red line, right, any evidence they were moving towards a weapon. During the third presidential debate, though, last year, Obama had a very carefully crafted, well thought through statement about that he would not allow Iran to get a breakout capability, right? It wasn't immediately apparent what he, uh, how he operationalized that in his mind, but based on statements that, that he has made and that other administration officials have made to include DNI Clapper, it appears to be that the point at which Iran could move so rapidly towards producing fissile material that they could not be detected in time to be stopped even if they did so at open declared facilities like Natanz and Fordo. That, that, is, that the breakout capability, or what David calls a critical capability, is the ability to basically dash to a weapon in, or the fuel for a weapon in plain sight. The issue then becomes when might they hit that threshold? And under some worst case scenarios, based on current trend lines, they might hit it sometime in 2014. The issue is not whether Iran, therefore, in 2014, will necessarily make the decision to dash for nuclear weapons. We don't know whether they would or they want, and probably the probability is that they won't, but they might. The issue is more from a U.S. perspective, this maybe becomes the last moment in which the intelligence community could come to the President of the United States with high confidence and say, boss, we'll know when they, when they move towards nuclear weapons. And if we lose the ability to detect when they would move for there, then the ability to prevent Nuclear weapons goes down dramatically, and the military option slips off the table. So in my mind, this is a, a very much a decision point for us, right? This is the decision point about when is the last time that we can we, – we, when do we know we've exhausted diplomacy? And for me, it's when they hit this technological threshold. Some people don't agree with that. But if my, if my argument is right and where I think David is right – then you put that star on the calendar and you say mid-2014, late-2014, whatever your assessment is, and then you say that's the amount of time I have to get a diplomatic deal. And that means you have 12 or 18 months. Right. So let's get on with it. Right. But as you, as you say, there are other steps that would have to be taken for Iran to build not just one nuclear weapon but several nuclear weapons. Uh, the problem is that the IAEA – is, is probably not able to detect that because that could be done in secret. It's facilities that are not under safeguards. The U.S. intelligence community may have capabilities to detect some of that, but the guarantees uh, that they will be able to provide to the president are going to be much lower. So that's why it's, a, it's David's referring to it as a critical capability, but it doesn't mean you know that's when Iran will build nuclear weapons at all. That's not what, what it means. All right, other questions? We have Barbara Slavin right here, and then we'll take others. Thanks. Uh, Barbara Slavin from the Atlantic Council, and I'll monitor. David, this is also for you, and forgive me if, if you discussed it before I, I came in. Um, I wanted your evaluation of why Iraq is slowing down. Is this deliberate, do you think, on the part of the Iranians not to be provocative? Uh, with the uh, paving over of Parchin, uh, is it now going to be impossible to determine what happened there. And finally, uh, there's going to be a meeting between Iran and the IAEA on, I think it's September 27th or 28th. Uh, I've been given to understand that the IAEA, IAEA has seven items that it wants to discuss with Iran. Are you aware of that, George? Are you aware of that, Daryl? Um, can okay. you give us a little information about what the IAEA is going to bring up? Thanks. We covered a little bit of that, but uh, why don't you hit yeah, some of points, think, David? Yeah, I think they're... Um, I think they... Um, are, are slowing down their 
announcements of when it will start, I think they, they couldn't have met them in any case. I mean, it, they, they made a kind of a big statement. They would make a certain number of fuel assemblies by this August. It was going to be 55 fuel assemblies. They need about 150 for a full core load. They made 10. And, it, and so I think they, they – and they also – we're not even sure – they haven't even put in all the equipment in the reactor. And they've depended on foreign procurement for that reactor. And, and it's not clear they have everything together um, for that reactor yet. And again, we'll, we'll have, yeah, we don't have a lot of information, and the IE just can look at the reactor and see what's there. But um, the reactor isn't finished. They're slower on fuel, and so I think they, they just are being more realistic and, 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 and announced a delay. Now, I, I think on, on Parcheen, I, 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 we've watched this debate, and, and, we, and on Parcheen, we've, we've really just been trying to figure out what's going on. We don't know. And I'll be honest, we don't know the tests that were done in that chamber. The IE never said. And people have speculated. I mean, we've looked at three possibilities of what could have happened inside Parcheen. Um, and, and we don't know which of those three it could be. Um, typically, people who have been attacking the IE on, IAEA on this have been picking one and going after it. But the IE has never said that's the test that happened in there. And so we don't know if there was nuclear material involved. Um, it may... The, the only statement that's clear is that there were high explosive tests um, the, or the allegation is high explosive tests related to the development of nuclear weapons. And so, um, so therefore, we don't know if you can detect anything. And with the amount of work that's been done there, I would give it a low probability. I mean, we, I think people overrate what environmental monitoring can do. It's a very powerful tool. But I can tell you the successes – have often been because of the mistakes of the adversary. And so you take an example in Iran where they, they detected things at a facility called Kali Electric. Um, they detected, they didn't detect anything in the facility Iran cleaned up. There were several buildings at Kali Electric. One, they cleaned up very well, painted, re redid surfaces, moved room, walls. They didn't detect anything. What happened is Iran forgot to redo something in another building it didn't clean out a ventilation duct, um, and that's where they found it. And so Iran knows that it made a mistake. I mean, from our point of view, the next time this came up, they actually took down a facility at Labazan Xi'an that was related to military dimensions uh, of the program. And, and they just removed it. And then they've created a sports complex there. And at Parchin, we don't know what they're doing. I mean, but it's, it's very suspicious. And I'm not optimistic that the IE, one, is asserting that there's nuclear material used there that would be detected. Or, and, and if there is, that Iran has done so much at the site, whether you could detect it. And I think... Well, no, I think, I, I think you have to move on. I mean, I really think that if, you know, we don't, with Labazan Xi'an, you tried something else. You, you look at, it's, it's called the Physics Research Center. You look at procurement information, and then and there's a lot of compelling information that allows you to ask a whole series of questions about what happened at that site. And so I think you have to, you know, if Iran does something that blocks you, you don't just keep throwing yourself against that wall. You move around it. And, and I think that's one of the things that has to happen. Now, one of the issues the Iranians or the IA raised is they said explicitly this time they do want Iran to talk about procurement in terms of these, these possible military dimensions. Iran had, had announced about a year or two ago that it wouldn't talk about procurement anymore. And so they, they do want Iran to, to reverse itself and be willing to talk about procurement, and that's one of the ways to get around um, some of these walls that have been created. Okay. Uh, uh, what, just very quickly, Barbara, we got other questions? No, the other, uh, I don't know what the seven questions, questions are. I mean, their report points. talks about what they need to, um, yeah, to accomplish. To yeah, to they, accomplish. They, and I think they've laid it out. I think I they, think you know, an example would be they've been asked, and this was, and again, the IE makes mistakes. I mean, I, I personally think they made a mistake asking to go to Parcheen in such an explicit way because they, they given the history, they, they, it was almost guaranteed that Iran would just start repaving everything and ripping things down. I mean, that, they should have thought this through um, a little more deeply. But, but on, on the um, question, the, the, um, they, I think, are trying to get Iran to sit down and negotiate and, uh, and that these seven statements are important. And, and one was, look, 
we're investigators. We're not going to tell you everything we know. What, what kind of prosecutor would ever go in and, and reveal all the evidence to the accused? And so, and Iran has said, well, you know, until you give us all information, we won't talk to you. But, but again, Parchin's an, Parchin's an example. We, we asked to go there, and suddenly there's all kinds of construction activity. So the eye is making it clear. Yes, we want this investigation. We want to solve this. But there's certain conditions that we need met, and one of which is don't expect us to tell you everything we know because that's part of our investigatory tool to find things out. Okay. Why don't we, why don't we move on to the next question? Uh, yes, sir. Right Right in front of you, Wyatt. Um, Michael Lemon, former State Department. George, I'd like you to elaborate a little bit on your last comments about uh, even if one is able to negotiate a big, big uh, deal, how one could sell it in the respective domestic political context. Uh, we've seen in the Iranian case when a particular leader or faction uh, is seen as making progress that others will come and like the crabs in the crab pot, pull him down and prevent him from moving forward. And you suggest uh, that's uh, the same thing facing uh, President Obama, perhaps, uh, in this context. How do you deal with that? And then secondly, in the negotiations themselves, um, the experience over the years of American-Iranian interactions has shown the importance of personalities, if I can put it that way, uh, in terms of the the personal characteristics of lead negotiators or interlocutors, whether they um, they click, whether they fit with one another. Right. Uh, I've heard one negotiator, American, described as, you know, he's just uh, mechanical. He's not human. So, uh, so what difference will Zarif make, for instance? Exactly. All right. All right. And so why don't we, why don't we go, let, let George answer. Okay. okay. Great. Um, great to see you, Mike. We, we go way back to Pakistan 20 years ago. Um, selling the, uh, an agreement in the U.S. context. Well, a, a couple of things. Um, I think it's very important, and people here, I'm sure, have done it or are doing it, um, to map the, the sanctions that are there. And there's a, The U.S. has had national sanctions on Iran since 1978, all right? Um, so, and, and Ken Katzman and others at Congressional Research Service, the Atlantic Council, have done a whole volume of the sanctions. But so you need to understand those that the president, in a sense, unilaterally with presidential authority, uh, could waive. All right, because that gives them more discretion, um, as distinct from those that would require congressional concurrence and under what terms, because different of the sanctions are written in different ways in terms of, of, you know, whether the president can do it with an affirmative vote by the Congress or as long as there's not a negative vote by the Congress. And so you need to map all of that to figure out just how much the president could do, even if he didn't get support, and have that uh, in mind. Also, some of what Iran needs in a in a deal is is e the president can deliver. I mean, this question about do we accept that there's enrichment in Iran? Well, I mean, you know, as at, at, a, at a declaratory sense, um, he can do he can do that. But ultimately, to to provide as uh, and, and also um, a lot of what concerns the Iranians are European Union sanctions, and so there's you know, some autonomy there, although the U.S. Congress has written some sanctions where the U.S. will sanction our European allies if they're trading with Iran, so extraterritorial sanctions, um, which around the world people aren't that wild about, but it, but sometimes can be uh, effective. And so I think you, you have to map that. But, but fundamentally, um, I think the president understands that the Republicans are never going to applaud anything he would do. The issue is how hard they'll fight, because as we see in, in town, it, 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 it's, there, there's nothing that he would do that they would really uh, support. Um, but, but are they willing to at least not fight all of it, or how hard would they be willing to fight uh, would be um, a key issue. And there um, is one of the ways in which Israel comes in is so important. Because if he reaches an agreement that addresses uh, realistic Israeli concerns in a, in a satisfactory uh, way, then that will change the dynamic 
uh, in Congress, not because Republicans would be, uh, you know, supporting Obama or whatever, but because they'd be getting other messages. Um, uh, this is too important. Uh, don't, don't, don't mess with it. So I, mean, I think that's um, part of uh, how you sell it. Um, but ultimately, um, if the deal's big enough, as Colin said, and got enough from the Iranians, it allows the president to then go out and use the bully pulpit that says, look, the alternative over time was war. And the country doesn't want that. Iran is, you know, ten times bigger than Syria, et cetera, you know, three times bigger than Iraq uh, in terms of population. We, you know, that was the path we were heading on. I've got this deal, um, you know, that other governments have supported and the military supports and so on and so forth. These were the two choices. And so if, if you know, a faction in the House of Representatives that doesn't agree with anything I do wants to block this, I, you know, turn it to the people. And so I think he could, you could use the bully pulpit if it's big enough. But something incremental, he can't, at least in my opinion. The last thing on personalities. I mean, the, I, mean I've, I, I know the Iranian uh, team and... And it's great news and challenging news. And Zarif, the foreign minister, um, is one of the, the smartest, funniest people I've ever met in, in professional life. I mean, he's hilarious, uh, and extremely witty, um, and absolutely brilliant. And so that's, and, and I don't think he believes it's in Iran's interest to have a nuclear weapon, you know, personally. Uh, and he was involved in the 90s in building confidence with the Saudis and the others in the Arab world. He was a leader in the, that period under Khatami where the Iranians were improving their relations. That's what he does. Rouhani, similarly. But it means they're also very formidable negotiators um, because unlike some of their predecessors, they're not dumb. Uh, and they're not uh, ideological. Um, I mean, I know from people, you know, Khamenei appointed some of the predecessors. He says, you know, he may not be smart, but I trust him. Um, whereas these guys are really smart and he's not so sure about uh, trust. And so, and, and so in terms of how it's going to be to deal with them, we're going to have to really be sharp and on our game. And if you're trying to do stuff that's patently you know, unfair and unbalanced, they're just going to be able to, to you know, slap us around the head rhetorically. Uh, and so it's going to be hard. And then I think it's going to be important to have somebody who's on our side who's got a sense of humor. Um, because and Barbara knows them too. Uh, because you don't, you're gonna you're gonna feel like an idiot first of all because you're not getting the jokes, you're not laughing, and then the other people in the room are gonna go, "Come on, that was funny." I mean, you know, and and so we need to have somebody with a sense of humor. Maybe this explains why John Stewart was at the State Department the other yeah, day. Maybe yeah, he's gonna go. get. All right, job. we'll have to have another <laughs> panel on comedy and, and diplomacy and international affairs at some point. Um, before we get to uh, kind of a, a quick lightning round of questions, because we're running out of time, I'm going to ask for a couple of questions at once and then ask the speakers to briefly address them. I'm going to uh, ask a variation of the previous question to, to Colin about um, sanctions. I mean, we talked about the need to uh, assess what sanctions are in place and what the president's options are in terms of relaxing the sanctions. But there are some uh, members of Congress who have been advocating that there should be yet another uh, tougher round of sanctions um, uh, approved by Congress. The House passed uh, a bill uh, uh, a couple months ago. Uh, the Senate might do that. They argue that uh, that's the approach that will work. Uh, some of them uh, want sanctions that don't allow the president waiver authority. Um, uh, I think I know what your answer is. I want you to just explain what some of the considerations are with that approach and what some of the problems are and how that makes a deal uh, more difficult. So I think, you know, I agree mostly with what uh, George said about the challenges at the end, but I also think one of the big challenges, Daryl, as you alluded to, is that Congress could do some things in the interim to make it even harder. So it's hard now. It's really hard now. And I think it's only possible in the context of a big deal, which is what I said. But in the interim, Congress could do some things that will make it even tougher. Uh, uh, in particular, um, you know, they may time certain sanctions legislation in a very inconvenient way. So I suspect if there's no negotiations in September, we get beyond UNGA, there's maybe serious strikes uh, that, will, that will see the Senate act on some version of what the House passed, which was basically a de facto trade embargo against uh, Iran. Uh, that would be very significant. How that plays into the factional disputes between Rouhani and, and the others that will be kind of kick-started uh, kick by, by the Syria operation. It's, it, these are a lot of, this is a very complex equation. So part of it could be the timing and nature of the, of the sanctions. But the other issues, I think, are that there's a lot of momentum in Congress to strip presidential waiver authority 
from sanctions. That's a big problem because it both limits the ability of the president to suspend the implementation of sanctions for certain periods of time to either implement a confidence building measure or do these interim phased approaches. So that ties the president's hands on that. It also makes it more difficult for the president to hold the international coalition together because his ability to waive sanctions against certain third parties is an inducement to uh, encourage them to cooperate in some other areas. Last but not least, there have been talk in Congress, although I hope this is, is receding, of not only passing sweeping new sanctions against Iran to fill all the loopholes, but to tie them not just to Iran's nuclear program, but to human rights progress, democracy, women's rights, minority rights, which are all laudable goals, but effectively communicates to the regime, unless the regime changes, you're not gonna, we're not going to lift the sanctions. So anything that is put into a major piece of legislation on Iran's nuclear program, which also includes requirements to certify that Iran is a human rights respecting Jeffersonian democracy before the sanctions get lifted, is a vote for war with Iran. Right? And I, I, I think that people in Congress are starting to wake up to that. Uh, but if they aren't, I hope they heard what I just said. Uh, uh, so th it's not just important to get Congress on board at the end. It's to not have them make it more difficult uh, along, the, along the way. All right. That's an important point. All right. We're going to take uh, a couple, three questions here. Uh, one question each quickly, and then I'm going to have uh, each of the speakers try to handle them. Yes, sir. Um, I'm Ed Almadar from the UN Association. I wonder if the panelists could expand on potential roles for the UN above and beyond the IAEA and even the Security Council, if you will, action by the UN General Assembly, actions of some kind by the UN Secretariat, given the problems we're having in Syria now where we've had a rejection by the administration of UN action. Thanks. All right. Next, sir. Thanks. Yeah, Ken Meyer, Gord, World Docs. Would it help in our negotiations with Iran if we required Israel to uh, uh, clarify its nuclear posture, and if it turns out they do have nuclear weapons, forcing them to get rid of them? All right, and then behind you, uh, I recognize Arms Control Association Senior Fellow Greg Tillman. Yes, Greg. Yes, this is a political question, I think, uh, for George and Colin. If indeed the Supreme Leader is convinced that the ultimate U.S. objective is regime change, and of course this is not just the Supreme Leader who thinks this. Aren't we on the wrong track And how the administration is handling Syria by, by citing Iranian victimhood for CW in the past, but uh, not mentioning that the U.S. on that occasion uh, aided the perpetrator of the attack, and continuing to insist that there's no role for Iran at the table for any Geneva II discussions about Syria's future. All right. Three good but tough questions. Why don't we start with George? I, yep. Colin. Um, on, on the question about the UN and the possible role of the Secretary or the General Assembly, um, I, 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 my imagination is too limited to see a, a, a positive role. And if a big problem is the U.S. Congress, as we just talked about, um, I would keep the UN as far away from it as, as possible. Um, on the question about, you know, would it help for Israel to clarify its capability? Um, a, that wouldn't happen. B, if it happened, it would be counterproductive. Um, there's a reason why Israel has never declared that it has nuclear weapons and why Egypt, for example, has never said that it does, but talks about unsafeguarded uh, fissile material, is that all of the countries in the region would actually be under more pressure to acquire nuclear weapons or to resist if Israel overtly had a capability or tested it, uh, God forbid. The Iranians aren't insisting that, you know, the Israeli uh, nuclear capability be part of a negotiation. Um, and so I, I think um, uh, we should leave it aside. Now, if there is a diplomatic resolution to the Iranian issue or if Iran is bombed over this issue, much more attention afterwards is going to be focused on Israel's nuclear capability. And that may be a good thing. In other words, people want to say, wait, Iran made a deal to get rid of you know, what it was worried about. Now, why doesn't Israel, number one? Or number two, wait a minute, you just went to war over Iran, but you know, what about Israel? So those can happen later. But in terms of a diplomatic solution, I think it's, it's basically unrelated and should be left uh, unrelated. And lastly, on Greg's thing on um, Syria... No, I mean, I, 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 th I think what the administration is trying to do so far and what Rouhani is trying to do so far is, is, to, is to not let what's going on with Syria get in the way of what they 
want to pursue on the nuclear channel and, and bilaterally. And I think Obama has been very cautious in this way. I think the Iranians have been very uh, cautious in this way. Um, we're never going to agree on Syria. We're always going to be on opposite uh, sides because the Iranians have a profoundly different interest there than, um, uh, than we do. Um, so I, I, that one seems to me still to be um, manageable, and both sides seem to me to be doing a pretty good job of trying to um, uh, kind of walk and chew gum at the same time. So I so I'm not going to comment on the on the Israel uh, issue. I think George covered that well. Um, I think expanding uh, the current talks to include more UN uh, uh, involvement is not a good idea. The P5 plus one is plenty big and unwieldy enough, uh, and it has the members of the Security Council in it, the permanent ones. In fact, I think the key is not to make it bigger, but to make it smaller. That is a, a sustained bilateral conversation between the United States and, and Iran is the only way that this deal really gets done. I mean, the P5 plus one can endorse it and modify it, but this deal is only going to get done in a quiet room with very senior Iranian and American officials. Um, on the Syria issues, Greg, um, look, I think the moderates have reasons to cut a deal on, on, on the nuclear issue and, and resolve some of the pressure and the sanctions and isolation completely separate from Syria and themselves are trying to downplay the criticality of Syria in those calculations. I think if the American strike is as advertised and it's relatively limited in duration and scope, uh, that'll make it easier for them. If it looks like it's aimed at regime change, that'll make it much harder for them and their competition with IRGC folks who might want to play a spoiler role. I, could, I totally agree with you, though, that I think that there's some value near it in, in terms of the discourse of the Obama administration to say something about the U.S. experience in the 1980s vis in, in the context of the Iran-Iraq war. My personal view mm -hmm. is that something along the following lines would be a good idea to be in somebody's speech, Kerry, Obama, somebody. And it would say something like, we were wrong in the, in the 1980s to look the other way when Saddam used poison gas against his own people and against Iran. And Assad's allies are wrong today to look the other way when he does the same thing to, uh, to uh, his people. We've owned up to our mistakes in the past, like our involvement in the Mossadegh coup. We can own up to this. We're, we're strong enough to survive that. And it would help Rouhani and Rafsanjani and others who are making the argument that Iran as the biggest victim can't look the other way in the context of its ally using weapons. So I think it, it, would, it helps them on the margins make their case and removes the argument from their opponents that we're hypocrites. So I would, I, that's what I would be uh, advocating. I don't know if that will happen or not. Last but not least, I hope and I suspect that the administration is thinking about day after planning for Syria, not just in terms of how to use the strike to galvanize diplomacy on Syria, but how to minimize the collateral damage of the strike on the Iran diplomatic track and potentially even leverage the strike mm -hmm. to have some conversations with the Iranians which might pull them into a bilateral discourse with the United States on a whole host of issues. So I don't know that that's happening. I hope they're thinking about it, and if they aren't, they should. Okay. Yeah, when, on, the, on the UN involvement, I think I see two – potential roles. Certainly on uh, the, the UN Security Council should strengthen the sanctions. I mean, uh, I talked about illicit goods. I mean, there more needs to be done um, to make it harder for Iran to, to buy the goods it needs for its nuclear program. And, and maybe in the distant future, Iran will be able to go out freely and buy these things, like let's say, for example, Brazil can do for its centrifuge program. We're far from that day. And I think trying to strengthen the, the, the role of the, of the UN through the UN panel of experts, the sanctions committee, to be able to, to better uh, implement the sanctions and, and also to add goods that are, that are, are banned to Iran um, would, be, would be very useful. Um, on the Israel question, I think there, the, the deals that were discussed in the 2003 to 2006, they include dealing, at least starting to deal with this Israeli question. I think any P5 plus one deal should have that, and the UN, if it passes some kind of endorsing uh, resolution, should have it, that there needs to be a broader discussion in the Middle East about arms control. There already and, and, is. There, I mean, there's already the agreement to have a conference on his own free of yeah, weapons about destruction, and we know what's happening with that. So we're going to repeat that, fine, but... Well, I think it, it was done in the, in the context of the, the, the resolutions after the, the Iraq War in 91. Right. And it led to a whole series of actions that I think were very positive and were not destructive as this uh, nuclear weapons free zone debate. So I think there's ways to do it that can encourage this kind of discussion um, that doesn't create this conflict that can't be resolved. All right. I want to thank everybody. Uh, we're, we're out of time today. I think it's been a very 
important discussion. Um, as, as I think everybody was saying, that the, the, the Iranian program is advancing, but there's still time for diplomacy, but that diplomacy is going to have to be much more sophisticated, creative, energetic, even as uh, the problems in the Middle East uh, proliferate. Um, so I want to thank uh, George Perkovich, Colin Call, David Albright for your remarks and comments and insights. Uh, thanks, everyone, for being here. And uh, more information on the Carnegie Endowment website, uh, as well as the Arms Control Association website, including our new uh, briefing book on the Iranian nuclear puzzle. Thank you.